Right people, welcome to the Irish National Heritage Park here in um, Wexford, just outside Wexford town. Admission for an adult is 11 euro, so uh, let's go in and have a look here. Saying here, distance of two kilometres, a time trail, follow the time trail for a unique perspective on Ireland's rich past. Uh, there are three time zones, prehistoric Ireland, which is in the green one, early Christian Ireland, which is the pauper one, and an age of invasion, which is the red one. Take our free guided tour or explore at your own pace. So I'll go at my own pace here. So it's saying here that um, like once taught the stuff of legend, archaeology is now producing the excavated evidence for such royal houses and what has been found matches the descriptions in the ancient manuscripts very closely. This house is modelled on that evidence and gives a very good indication of what a royal house of over a thousand years ago would have looked like. However, this is also a functional space used for feasts, exhibitions, theatre and music, so we have left much of the interior open for public use. Um, the main structural timber of the walls are oak, with double walls of willow wattling. The space between the double walls is filled with crushed seashells, which gives good thermal mass and dries quickly after flooding. A common event on Cranogs, including this one, the walls are plastered with lime, a natural product which was widely used in early medieval Ireland. The roof above your head weighs over 8 tonnes. If you look up, you can see that this massive roof is held together by an enormous spoked wheel carved of oak. We do not know if this is how these roofs were built long ago, but the wheel is a symbol of the old Celtic sky gods. Its shape also recalls the radial division of the house below, as it would have been laid out more than a thousand years ago. The drop piece is carved in the shape of an acorn, the fruit of the most important tree in ancient Ireland, the oak. Um, that little island there is called um, a Cranach. Um, Right, it says, um, why, why build, build a cranach? So it's an artificial thing on, on a lake, right? There are many reasons why to build a cranach, but much has to do with creating a place apart, a distinctive bounded place separated physically from the surrounding world. Such a place could offer security from enemies or wild animals, a safe and remote location to pursue crafts like metalworking or to detain prisoners or hostages. It could even offer a kind of neutral territory for negotiations between adjacent warring parties. If you were a king, a Cranach provided a way of building a residence that was clearly set apart from the rest of society, yet very prominent in the wider landscape. It also allowed a ruler control of local waterways, so important for communication, trade and military manoeuvres. And there's... Um, a picture of a gaming board, a thousand year old gaming board from Ballanderry, Cranach, County Offaly. The waterlogged conditions on Cranach sites means that artefacts which would never survive on dry land are sometimes recovered in near perfect condition. Wow. And there's kind of like a drawing there of, you know, see there's the, 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 the lake around it and that's the Cranach. So this here represents uh, a Viking village. So it's saying over here, the Vikings, right? 
Often, often seen as terrifying raiders, the Vikings were also superb seamen, traders and statesmen who played a decisive role in shaping much of European history. The Vikings exploded from Scandinavia around 1,200 years ago and spread rapidly through Britain, Ireland and Western Europe. They ventured across the Atlantic, establishing colonies in Iceland and Greenland and even reaching the coast of America 400 years before Columbus. Vikings from Sweden spread through Russia and down as far as Byzantine, Byzantium, which would be the Greek, um, would it be Greek Ottoman Empire at the time I think it was, or maybe it was the Roman Greek I think it was. Um, or modern day Istanbul. In Ireland the Vikings built our first towns, minted the first kinds, introduced new art styles and expanded trade with Britain and the continent. Through their descendants, the Normans, the Vikings continued to shape Europe, European history right into the Middle Ages. And it says here, one of the reasons why the Vikings received such bad press from, um, from contemporary writers was that they were pagans at the time when the rest of Europe had been Christian for centuries. They had a very rich mythology based on a struggle between the forces of light and darkness. Human and animal sacrifice formed an important part of this religion. A German historian, Adam of Bremen, writing nearly a thousand years ago, described a great festival in the Viking town of Uppsala in Sweden, where men and animals were slaughtered every day for nine days. The heads offered to the gods and their bodies hung from the trees around the temple. When an important man died, one of his slave girls would be strangled and burnt with him on the pyre. A warrior slain in battle could hope to find a seat in Odin's hall of Valhalla, where he would feast and fight forever. The less fortunate ended up in the gloomy realm of the dead, dead known as H.E.L. Hell. So, I'm just guessing that this is where, where they would have kept animals inside or something. Although there's a little bellow and a fire uh, there as well, like so. So just fantastic, isn't it? Um, of, a, of a Viking, uh, uh, of a Viking village, and down here looks like it's a kind of a trough on the ground where the water comes off the the roof, and you see that there. Look, it's all around the building. Now I don't know if the water is supposed to run off, go away. Um, Or uh, if they if they were meant to collect the water, I don't know. Or maybe they're just doing it for here for the keep the water away from away from the place here. Look at the reed the reed bush there, isn't it gorgeous? This is an amazing information you're getting here in this heritage centre here in Wexford. Um, here's the story of a guy called Robert Fitzstephen, right? Uh, so it's saying here that the Vikings arrived in Ireland in the 9th century and developed the port town of Dublin, Wexford and Waterford a hundred years later, okay? The Vikings' um, descendants were known as the Hiberno-Norse 
and eventually became part of a multicultural Irish society. They performed an important role as international traders and the naval power of Irish kings. However, when Dermot McMurrah, the deposed king of Leinster, left Ireland in 1166 to enlist the help of Henry II in regaining his kingdom, everything was about to change. So there's a, obviously there's a big fight or war fight here. Um, and a force of 400 Norman knights, uh, archers and men at arms landed on the sandy shores of Barrow, sorry, shores of Bannon Island, Wexford, okay? This contingent with its 100 horses splashed the shore from a series of small ships which had sailed from Wales. The force was led by Robert Fitzstephen, the son of the Welsh Princess Nesta and our Norman husband Stephen, the constable of Cardigan. Historic accounts relate how Fitzstephen was joined by Dermot McMurrah and 500 Irish warriors. The combined force marched 20 kilometres north to attack the Hiberno Norse town of Wexford. When the residents of Wexford realised they were under attack, they retreated inside the walled town and defended themselves against Fitzstephen and McMurray's forces. During the fight in the town's suburbs and ships in its harbour were born. The crew of one trading vessel which had recently arrived from Britain managed to escape by cutting away their ship's anchor, eventually to prevent further bloodshed. The inhabitants of Wexford surrendered to Dermot McMurray, who promptly granted the town of Wexford to Robert Fitzstephen and his brother, making Wexford the first Anglo-Norman town in Ireland. Fitzstephen now had control of one of Ireland's main ports. Although Dermot McMurrah had invited the Anglo-Normans to Wexford to use their military power to win back his kingdom, he had inadvertently started the conquest of Ireland. Within two years, McMurrah was dead and Henry II had divided much of Ireland between his loyal knights. So, according to that there, that was how Britain eventually made our way into Ireland and continued their, their rule over us for 700 years. I think so now, just by reading that. Isn't it great? That's something, something there now that I never knew about in, in our history. So get out people and travel around places and it's just, you know, you're going to discover fascinating things for sure, you know. Now, isn't the wild um, forest bush magnificent when it's in bloom? Yellow, looks not gorgeous. Beautiful. So that river out there is the River Slaney, and it's just saying here again the story about Robert Fitzstephen. Uh, the River Slaney rises in Wicklow and flows to the sea in Wexford Harbour. In the medieval period before the development of efficient road transport, rivers like this were essential routeways to the interior of the country. The Slaney is one of the longer rivers in Ireland and is navigable inland as far as Enniscorthy, which is a short distance from Ferns. Dermot McMurray's medieval capital of Leinster. Control of the Slaney played a vital role in the colonisation of Wexford and Norman knights like Robert Fitzstephen built a series of ringwork castles on its banks. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to read the rest of it there, but you could just continue if, if you want to know about the area and history and stuff, just loads of information here, loads of it. Well, I'm just reading here off a sign here. It's a making mortar, the medieval way. The use of mortar was introduced to Ireland in the early medieval period, around 1,000 years ago. Mortar mixers like the one here were probably used for the biggest construction projects for building churches, round towers, and later castles and abbeys. The reconstruction you see here is based on limited excavation results and practical experiment. A stout vertical oak post serves as an axle on which the long horizontal beam turns. The series of paddles hanging from this beam mix the mortar in the pit below. Two people can easily turn the mechanism while a toad adds in the mortar mix and water. So this was how they 
done made the mortar with lime and you see this here this got torn around you see see the sticks there look and on the big post and it goes round and round and it's like it's like a big stolen pot really you see look there's lime in that there kind of like clay and lime so that's what he used that's how he done it um you see look that could torn 360 look see it there and see this, the things and they're mixing around pretty cool my friends pretty cool so look they're experimenting there on the the walls look so it's obviously lime and clay or something um, that was the first mortar amazing isn't it to see this and that's how he done it pretty cool can you hear the boards it's not just heaven isn't it boards singing and sunshine fantastic the gods of wet places wet places like bogs rivers and lakes were important sacred zones in ancient ireland some of the finest metalwork we have from the late prehistoric period 2000 to 3000 years ago has come from wet places where it was cast into the water as an offering to the gods some people see these offerings as ways in which wealthy people can show their power over others through their ability to throw valuable metal walk away. Others point to our changing climate which became wetter and colder around this time and see these offerings as attempts to influence whatever gods had control over the weather. However, there was a darker side to some of, the, some of these offerings. Human sacrifice was also practiced in these places with the victim pinned beneath the bog or tortured and strangled before being cast into the gloomy waters. Idols like this one here have been found in wet places and we know from early writings that idols were often erected in places where sacrifices were being made. The next time you throw a coin into a wishing well, think about what you are doing. You are repeating the actions of long forgotten ancestors making an offering to the gods of wet places looking for your wish to be granted. So. I think maybe that there look is a real what is one they found maybe maybe not in in a bog uh, pretty gloomy looking face on the on the wooded sculpture isn't there yeah In the pit here, some 200 litres of water can be brought to the boil in this fashion in just two or three minutes. A few more hot stones dropped in at intervals keeps the whole thing simmering nicely. The used stones are thrown up behind the pit to create the characteristic horseshoe shaped mound which identifies these sites in the landscape today. Most seem to date from three to four thousand years ago in the middle of the Bronze Age but they may have continued in use for much longer. They are one of Ireland's most common monuments and are found all across the island. They are usually regarded as cooking places and experiments have shown that they work very well as such. However, they could have been used for many other things, for washing or as a sauna, for dyeing clothes or even making beer. Pretty amazing my friends, pretty amazing.
Right, just, 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 just listen here for a second between the gentle flow of this little creek or river, small river, and the boards. Now, isn't that what you call um, therapy, isn't it? It's the only kind of therapy, my friends. The only kind. Oh, that must be, uh, for, uh, what do you call them wheels? Like, for crushing flour, look. And it goes into the wheel some way. I don't know how the wheel turns, but anyway. Cool. This was one of the world's first automatic machines. Before this, all grinding had to be done by hand, a back-breaking job normally carried out by female slaves. These new mills were nothing short of an industrial revolution and the idea spread rapidly throughout Ireland. Powerful landowners such as the nobles and the monasteries would have owned their own mills, but less well-off farmers could come together as a cooperative and take shares in a mill. It's a fact. Compulsory purchase orders are not a new invention. They were used 1500 years ago in Ireland to acquire land for the building of water mills like the one you see here today. If a suitable site for constructing a mill was found, the landowner could not object. His land was compulsorily purchased, he received compensation and the mill was built. This was so successful that within a few generations water mills had spread all across Ireland. Christianity. Fabulous temples were erected to this new god, and secrets were hewn in their stones. Now, cutting-edge science, graphics and archaeology unravel the enigma of Ireland's most iconic Christian sites, the mysterious Skellig Michael. The medieval powerhouse, Clonmac Noise, using state-of-the-art technology to uncover their true history. It's a story that has defied us to this day. By the 5th century, Tara had a 5,000-year history as Ireland's most sacred place. But its stories and its rituals were kept hidden in the memories of the Druids. At Tara, a new age was coming. In 433 AD, a great saint outwitted the Druids in both knowledge and magic. 
St. Patrick conquered the pagans with a god who did not require sacrifice, human or otherwise. So this area here is a, a replica of the monasteries back in Ireland. So um, I'll just read here from, from uh, here. So the monastery here contains elements drawn from a number of different sites and periods. The church and high cross are typical of later monasteries, particularly in the eastern half of the country, while the stone beehive cell is of a type found on the western coast. Monasteries like this tended to be divided into sacred and secular spaces. The sacred space is on the terrace and includes the church, the graves and a type of outside altar or grave shrine, while the secular space is below that and includes living and eating quarters. Sundials were often used to mark time and the monks would be called to prayer many times during the day. In the bigger monasteries there could be streets and lines of houses for the lay people who served the monastery. The circle here is of the type built in the southwest of Ireland. These circles are formed by an uneven number of boulders with a formal entrance marked by the two tallest stones. The lowest stone in the circle is always directly opposite the entrance and lying on its side and the whole circle is orientated upon a north east southwest axis. Some people think that this alignment was designed to help plot the movement of the sun, moon or stars and it is possible that one of their functions was to mark the different stages of the year. Look at uh, a diagram of how they think they were able to lift up or uh, move, move the big big stones and then how they erected them an idea. There are two important concentrations of stone circles in Ireland, one in the southwest Cork and Kerry and the other in the north in Mid Ulster. Burials are sometimes found inside the circles, but whether these represent sacrifices or sanctification of the circle, or simple, simply burial of honoured dead is unknown. Rows of standing stones were also erected around this time and again the main concentrations are in Cork, Kerry and Mid Ulster. Elsewhere great circles of timber pillars were raised while other circles were built by digging banks and ditches. Um, there is good reason to believe that all these monument types are related in some way and all may well be associated with some form of sky worship. Nearly 4,000 years ago, this tree, a Scots pine, was grown in a diverse, dense woodland in County Kerry in the southwest of Ireland. Imagine a landscape where these native pines competed for access to the skyline of a heavily wooded Ireland. In 1986, Michael Carroll found this log while searching for bog oak to indulge his passion for found art. He had the presence of mind to realise that what he had stumbled upon was the remains of a truly ancient tree. He sent a sample of the log to the United States where radiocarbon dating revealed its astonishing age. His family very kindly donated this tree to us and helped in financing its installation here. Well, it's just saying here about megalithic tombs all over Ireland, right? And the huge big stones. Uh, the weight of the huge stones. Some of the stones were a hundred tons, right? Um, and it's saying here to have a go at trying to move this one here. So this one here they're saying is two tons, right? So don't think they moved that my friends. Wow, look at this um, reconstruction here. Amazing.
The first people to come to Ireland arrived about 9,000 years ago, after the last Ice Age. This period is known as the Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age. These first people lived by hunting, fishing and gathering, moving from place to place and building campsites like the one you see here. They caught fish, sometimes using beautifully woven fish traps and hunted birds and animals for meat, especially wild pigs. They also collected nuts, berries, wild apples and all kinds of seeds. When they first arrived, they used tiny chips of stone called microliths to make blades, arrows and harpoons. Later they started using much heavier blades of stone. They speared widely they spread widely throughout Ireland, following rivers inland and travelling down the coast. Their way of life was so successful that it lasted virtually unchanged for 3,000 years. The reconstruction here shows an early campsite from 9,000 years ago. It is based on remains found at Mount Sandal, County Derry and elsewhere. The huts could have been basket shaped or built like a teepee. They were probably thatched with branches and reeds, maybe with earth banked walls. They may have buried their dead quite close to their houses. At a place called Hermitage in County Limerick, a number of huts, hut sites were found and nearby was a pit with the burnt remains of a man. A stone axe had been placed with his bones and a large post erected as a grave marker. Right people, that's it from the Irish National Heritage Park here in Wexford. It's just north of the town of Wexford on the N11. Um, well, well worth a visit. Uh, loads and loads of information all about Ireland going back to 9,000 years ago. Um, brilliant reconstructions of different um, time periods like the Bronze Age, the Stone Age. All that kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, it was 11 euros, for, 11 euros admittance for an adult, um, but well worth it. Well, well worth it. So that's it from the Irish National Heritage Park here in Wexford on a beautiful, beautiful uh, day in the month of March. And I'll see you all in the next video. I actually know where I'm going to be because I've got as far as Wexford Town now. So hopefully the next video up will be of Wexford Town. So uh, take care everyone and stay tuned for my next video. Normally up on a Sunday. So see us all then. Take care. Bye.